It's that time again. It's waterproof records time. I'm I'm excited. I hope you're excited too. Um, I always love shows when I have guests because it really it takes the show in unexpected places, and we get to learn a lot of stuff that you know. You know me as that '90s music guy, but I get the chance to hear how other people's journeys have been growing up. And uh, currently to where we are today, and that's exactly what today is going to be about. So you clicked on the episode. If you don't recognize this name, you'll definitely recognize this voice and some of the hit songs that came out of this band. Um, But I am thrilled and so happy that today I get to welcome on the show Mr. Brian Vander Ark from The Verve Pipe. Let's go. Things are going to change. I can feel it. It just won't be that kind of body. Before I welcome Brian on the show, I got to talk about DistroKid. You know how much I love them, and you should be using them, definitely. I have a VIP link that's in my bio. It's in pretty much everything I put out there. You need to be using it because it gives you 30% off your first year of using DistroKid. And if you're wondering, if you're just now listening to the show and you're like, what is DistroKid? Well, it's the easiest way for you to get your music online everywhere like that. I'm telling you, it's fantastic. I wrote an album 15 years ago, and in one afternoon, I put it on Spotify, iTunes, Tidal, uh, uh, Amazon, YouTube. It was everywhere. Just so easy to get your art out to the world. So you should be using DistroKid. They make it so easy to share your music with uh, with everybody. So go to my profile, distrokid.com slash VIP slash waterproof. 30% off your first year. You can't beat that. Come on. Well, maybe you could beat it. Call me. Just kidding. Um, anyway, but thank you so much again for coming back to the show. And like I said up top, I am so excited about my guest today. This is someone that I've never had the pleasure of meeting in person. And we're, we just met right before the call began. So I'm excited to learn more about him and his life and us to just sit and talk about music together. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show, Mr. Brian Vander Ark from the Verve Pipe. There it is. Hi, everybody. Hello. <laughs> there we go. Look at how now, neat. Look at how neat everything looks in my uh, in my apartment too. Yes. The pillows are all fluffed and looking That's good. I brushed my teeth before, so he wouldn't have dreamed of starting the show with disheveled pillows or unbrushed teeth. So that's the thing about Brian. He's he's a man of class and taste and aesthetics. <laughs> Oh, nice. Well, I like it. In, in it. case I don't end up using that open, opening part, what just happened was I was yeah. so thrilled and excited that the the lead singer, songwriter, musician, extraordinaire, Brian Van Ark from the Verve Pipe was on my show that I, I started. We just started talking and I hadn't even hit record on the Zoom. So I had no video footage. I had audio footage, but no video footage. But now we're well, up these and are the classic. The, the thing about this is that with the most interesting uh, podcasts or shows, are when it's a casual conversation and we had jumped right into a kind of a casual conversation. Yeah. And so I don't blame you for that because I think I probably got you off guard there a little bit. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. This is, this is, you know, I've lived in Los Angeles now for quite some time. I worked in the movie biz. I know how it goes. Just, you know, this is the, this is the last day of my job. This is, I'm getting fired today. So I'm going to ask myself to be cleared out. I'm going to have my box. I'm going to go out on the street corner and the big truck is going to drive by as the water splashes on me. And, yeah. you know, that's that's my yeah. scene now. That's my scene. That reminds me of a uh, a quick story. We were out on the road years ago and and our keyboard player was, you know, the, some of the guys in the band have jobs outside right. of the band because, I mean, I'm able to I get the royalty money and that kind of thing. I'm able to, like, call the shots and yeah. be my own entrepreneur because I do the speaking gigs and all these other things. But I'm, I'm because I'm an entrepreneur like yourself, I don't have a boss. And so our keyboard player once was at a bit of a rant on the phone and we were he was also driving and we're like, dude, you got to pay attention to the road and he gets upset. And, you know, he's like, I got to deal with my boss. And then there was dead silence for about two minutes. And I piped in, what's a boss? 
Just like an asshole that I am. I love it. I love it. You know, you do not seem like an asshole. You seem like a genuinely kind, nice guy. You know, we're just now meeting for the first time, but you're you're from Michigan. I am. That's Michigan behind us. It's cold and dreary, and it's April. What is it? Is it? A- it's, I don't know. It's almost it's April. We're on the beginning. last. It's it's March thirty first. Is when and we're, we're it's this. snowing out there today, and wow. we had two feet of snow a week ago, and then you know this week it'll be up to seventy. It's a ridiculous. Uh, weather system we have here in Michigan. I remember. I remember. I've lived in L.A. for 20 plus years, but I lived in Illinois uh, for a little while. So not too far away from where you're at. And so I'm familiar with the unusual weather weather patterns and the uh, the bitter cold that can be up up around that way. So, well, I mean, Illinois gets the heat waves. What are you talking yeah. about? This is yeah, Michigan. It's true. We got the, the lake the heat, effect. Oh, the, the heat good. in the summer uh, can be can be brutal that's for sure it can be it's always a humid uh humid heat too which i hate yeah agreed agreed but michigan's great i love michigan it's a it's a good part of the world and so you know obviously you were born and raised there you have you lived there your whole life have you ever uh relocated for a short stint no i did i lived in la i lived in las Vegas for a few years and i lived in new york for a couple years so and chicago as well for two or three years so you know when i uh when i met my wife, I went, uh, you know, we, we decided that we were going to live in Michigan because, um, you know, it's a great place to raise a family and I'm from Grand Rapids and it's, you know, it's, uh, it, quite frankly, it's one of the best cities in the world as far as I'm concerned. I it's, mean, hey. It's still kind of small and it's got great food places and everything. So we moved here uh, and since then my wife and I separated, she still stayed in Michigan, which is a testament to me because she never really liked Michigan. Uh, so I'll take that uh, credit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, no, my kids love it. It's a great, it is a really great city to, uh, to uh, raise a family for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I want to get into, um, you know, the, the journey of, uh, you know, being a, being a dad and, and eventually writing some music for kids and getting into mm-hmm. that. But I want to take us back to um, where we started. So I, um, I, of course, the the Verve Pipe, well-known uh, hit songs along the way, and uh, The Freshman, there was a time in my life where you could not go anywhere without hearing that song sang with uh, fellow classmates with their arms around each other, being uh, wistful yeah. and thinking about this is all coming to an end, we're growing up. Um, and uh, I saw you on social media, you were at a karaoke place, and uh, you were there and you were singing along and uh, somebody filmed it and it got online and, and you were you had such a great attitude. And, and you, you'd mentioned before we rec- recorded the video a little bit about that story. I would love it if you recapped that a little. Yeah, I mean, I like to go into places where it's not very busy and where people don't recognize me. So yeah. outside of outside of Michigan or the Midwest, it's, you know. People are hard pressed to recognize me, right? Uh, which is super fun because I can get away with murder. And I'll go into a karaoke bar in the middle of bumfuck somewhere, and yeah. I'll, you know, when there's a dozen people in there, I'll put my name in and I'll sing the freshman, and I'll yeah. I'll give a I'll give a passionate performance of it like I always do live, and people have no idea it's me. That's and so the DJ great. at the end will say, "Hey, everybody, let's give it up for Brian." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so and I great. just laugh my ass off. And yeah. honestly, I feel like if something makes me laugh, that it's uh, that it's good social media content. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Well, you're you're a man after my own heart in terms of the uh, the laughter thing. That's really what got me into where I'm at today as well. Um, I started making these videos about bands that I loved and music that I loved that I grew up with, but it had a humorous twist. And uh, I wasn't really trying for anything. I was just doing the thing that made me laugh and I thought was really funny. And it turns out that that, uh, now more than ever, people kind of need to laugh, especially on social media, because things can get so heated and charged and heavy. And it's like, yeah, geez, we could use some levity, you know, in the world. So that's all I really follow. And, you know, I love TikTok. It's been my favorite format over the years, you know, by far. It's the most fun to make little short films and that kind of thing. And uh, I do. I watch. I appreciate humor on there more than anything. I do like the accountability thing for the police, you know, where somebody, mm-hmm. you know, where somebody's filming them and they oh, get into yeah, a yeah, confrontation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I watch those. I, I, I get so sucked into those, which is just because I like to see what the outcome is. 
but other than that, you know, it is most, I mostly follow funny people and uh, people that are making short films and comedy because you're right. That's exactly how I feel these days. It's like, there's so much going on. I need the levity. Yeah, you know, for need sure. The, need, need the laugh. And it's funny how the algorithm works. Cause like, I also watch those videos where somebody's, you know, recording themselves getting pulled over for a traffic stop. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, you get sucked into those and then the algorithms like nothing but cop content 24 yeah. hours a day for like a week yeah. straight. And you're like, okay, I, <laughs> I yeah. need you guys to go back to the other stuff. You know, it's just, it's so funny how it works. You watch one thing. Um, I turned a buddy on to TikTok, and he, uh, and then I, you know, checked in with them later and I said, what did you think of TikTok?" You know? And he goes, all I kept getting was women with giant breasts mm -hmm. showing their cleavage. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and my wife saw it and she said, I can't be on here. And I said, dude, you were seeing that because you stayed on one video <laughs> too long. Yes. yes that's what people, that's the funniest thing. Um, I think in these recent, I don't know if you've been following any of the TikTok hearings. I haven't been right. following it closely. But they've been sharing clips online and some of these guys that are anti TikTok and trying to shut it down. Um, one of them was sitting there and he's going, you know, I opened up the TikTok and I just got fed weeks of gyrating half naked yeah. women. And that's everybody was like, that's because you that's what you wanted to see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering when I saw that if that was fake or not, because it seems so outrageous. But oh. no, watching the rest of the hearings, I yes. could see how they're they're all idiots. I like, know. Oh. I know. It's just the one that's my favorite is the guy that goes, does it get onto your home Wi-Fi? Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> Ridiculous. It's amazing. Like, and, I, and this poor guy, with the, even with a little bit of the language barrier that he yes. had trying to explain himself, could not understand that question. Like I couldn't understand the question. Totally. What does that even mean? What do you mean gets on your Wi-Fi? <laughs> totally. It's like getting a call from your parents um, yeah. when they're asking why something isn't working in the email and you're on the yeah. phone and you're trying to walk them through a, a, some kind of technological change that's happened over the past 20 years. And you're like, this is... This is very difficult. This is very. I am my. I am my parents' personal IT helper for sure. For sure. Well, my parents even had a problem with answering machines back in the day. My mom would talk to an answering machine like it was a person, and she would say, "Would you tell Brian that he should call me?" I'm like, mom, you realize I'm the one that <laughs> listens to the message. <laughs> oh, our parents, the sweetest, the sweetest. I know. Um, I, so let's get into the Verve Pipe and the story yeah. uh, about this band that you started with your brother, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Brad and I started back in 1992. We were in yeah. another band and uh, before that, and we decided to break up our band. And then there was another band in town who was super popular and we wanted their crowd as well. And we thought, well, let's see if those guys would be interested in forming a super group. And we did that. We took two of the... I think two or three of the best players from that band and the two of us and um, and we formed the Verve Pipe and hit the ground running immediately because we had already had this big following from both our bands, you know, right. so it worked out, worked out terrific. In fact, our first album was done for this other band it was in called Johnny with an Eye with Brad and we just took the new players and we redid the drums and redid the guitars with the new players and we called it uh, the Verve Pipe. And uh, yeah. so that's how that first album came together, you know? Yeah. I read a lot about just the extensive touring and, you know, handing out CDs on college campuses and, yeah. you know, really uh, going after it hard and we building hard, a yeah. fan base in Michigan, you know, like we that did. being we a went, big part. We went really hard. We, we did. We would walk around campuses wherever we went to, you know, we had shows down and I think we played South by Southwest one year. And so we stopped uh, at a few colleges on the way and we just walked around and kids sitting in a group and we'd get students sitting in a group and we would give them CDs, you know, and then yeah. if we were playing that night in the town, we'd say, come see us, you know, we'll put you on the guest list or whatever, which promoters and clubs hated. And yeah. we'd show up with 50 people on the guest list or whatever. Uh, yeah. But it really did build uh, following for us, a nationwide following, dude, just yeah. doing the grassroots thing. I mean, back then it was the days of putting up flyers on, on, uh, you know, on uh, telephone poles, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. 
So, exactly. Yeah. So different now for bands. You know, I've had this conversation with a, a, another music um, songwriter friend of mine about, you know, we live in the era of, you know, I just said it at the top of the show, putting your music on Spotify. And that's really how you're going to try to build that groundswell and get that audience out and that handing out CDs while it's probably something you could still do on a college campus, I just don't know, you know, probably half those kids are like, I don't even own a CD player, you know? Yeah. So it's like, you got to, well, what's funny, we did those, you know, we, we did kids shows too and two kids albums and kids, you know, at a, at a kid show, they don't even know what a CD is. Right. You know, but they want, they want to buy it. They want their parents to buy them something, you know, just anything, sure. you know what I mean? And so we would sell more and we still do. Uh, well, we stopped playing kids shows, but we, we sell more of the kids merchandise than anything. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Believe yeah. I, I can imagine. So look, I'm a dad. I have two boys, um, two sons and the uh, kids market. Whew, you got, and parents will get their kids anything if they, you know, if the kids demanding enough, wants it enough. It's it's one of those things that you don't realize until you have kids that you go. Yeah. I need stuff for my kids. <laughs> well, what happens is what happened for us was we were, you know, when streaming started and streaming doesn't pay, by the way. I mean, it's yeah, I, it doesn't you know, four million streams of the freshman. I got paid two hundred dollars or something. Great. So you can't survive. <laughs> so we figured when when streaming started happening, we're going to have to figure something out. Um, yeah. And we uh, and I noted the guy because I had two kids. I was like, every time I buy one thing for one kid at any kid's performance, I'm buying stuff for all my kids, you know, and, yeah. uh, and that's true. I think of every parent, you're not just going to get one t-shirt for one kid. So I thought, well, let's do this. Let's put out a kid's record because, you know, hopefully we'll quadruple our sales, you know, our yeah. merchandise sales. And sure enough, it worked. And that's why we put out a second kid's record. Now I got so sick of playing kids shows that I said, I'll never play them again because they're the worst. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. The hardest shows to play for sure. And I bet I, I'm going to I'm going to put uh, a little bit of stake that it probably has a lot to do with less the kids, but actually the parents. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, honestly, if the if the kids get bored, right, then the parents get upset with you. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you have to be on. And our shows were only an hour for the kids shows. You know, our, our grown up shows are typically an hour and a half. Yeah. An hour kids show, though, and you have to be on. It's got to be boom, 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 boom. And there's no like taking time to tune. Like you right. got to be entertaining and talking to the kids, you know, yeah. or whatever the whole time. And it's just so exhausting. Totally. And then we would do a Then we would do an adult show that night. And it was like enough already. It's enough. I can't. Yeah. I can't do it anymore. I read that. I read that you were doing shows for kids, going and doing an adult show. I mean, that's grueling. That's a lot of stuff to do. That's a lot yeah. of energy expelled. It was a um, lot. Mm -hmm. I knew that the parents would be a challenge. Uh, for a short while there, I was the Cub Scout pack master for my son's um, oh. you know, troop. And I volunteered because it was something that I thought would be really special for me and my son. And when I left after two years, people were like, oh, that must have been so hard, you know, with the kids. And I was like, the kids are the easy part. Yeah. <laughs> it's the, yeah. it's the parents, parents of other children because they'll call you, they'll corner you, they'll go, my son needs this, you know, this is. And it, they get really, you know, people are very territorial and protective of their children and, and understandable. But when you're in a leadership role or you're in a entertainer role, people yeah. kind of forget that you are also a human being. <laughs> yeah. Well, I always got like I always got stories about their kids, you know, told to me. And I love hearing stories because that's that's very inspirational for, for songwriting. Yeah, definitely. But at every show, the meet and greets are so long with the kids because because yeah. not only are you meeting the kids, but the parents just want to talk your ear off about their kids. Right. And, she, and it's just like, OK, this is all wonderful. I love it. Yeah. But I got to go. It's been three hours. We yeah. have another show tonight. You know, that kind of thing. So. Yeah, exactly. So but back we're, we're going back to 1990. We're going back to you put out this sure. first Sorry. independent album um, and then you do another one. You do two before you get to get the record deal. Right. Yeah, we did two. We had seven or eight labels come out to see us. And we just, we were kind of the big fish in the small pound of Grand Rapids, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. small pond. And just were 
just could not believe that we we could not get a record deal. In fact, we we had record labels come and they they would come to our show and people would be singing the freshman the whole place, you know. We sold out the State Theater in Kalamazoo, 2,000 people singing the freshman and still didn't get signed to a record deal until RCA came back the second time with a different rep. Right. And he said, uh, I get it. He got he got it. He said, he well, give me a, a demo of your new material. Yeah. And I, you know, we already had the freshman had been released on the first album. And then yeah. um, and then we had photograph on the new uh, on the new tape that we gave him and a couple other songs that ended up on villain. So and then he signed us on the strength of that. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's the thing that I don't think people realize that if you were in Michigan, if you're around that area and you knew the Verve Pipe and you knew the band, the freshman was already the 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 sing along hit of the shows. You know, you guys had a lot of hits and things that were connecting with people at the time, but the world wasn't going to get it yet. But then it would be coming out on on villains on your first, you know, big label record. And that's where the world gets to hear this song and and many others. But what was it like yeah. going from what was that transition like of going from, you know, you're you're in Michigan and now it's it's everywhere. It's on the radio. It's on MTV. Uh, talk a little bit about just that experience. Yeah, I mean, there was a sense of entitlement that we felt. And uh, and that's unfortunate because, you know, it it, it was massive egos ensued, yeah. you know, yeah, uh, we it's had tough, gotten. Though. I mean, honestly, I look back at it now, and I my one regret is that I just didn't enjoy it and stopped. You know, the whole time I was thinking, "All right, what's next? What do we got to do next? We got to follow this up. We got to follow this up, or you know, this kind of thing." And you know, didn't want to do interviews and that kind of stuff. Um, and it's just a ridiculous how that happens. But when you have that massive success you feel like you know you feel like you're you too you feel like you know we can't do anything wrong now we can sure. do whatever we want and we proved to us and the world that that's not true at all we did a lot of things that were wrong right. you know a lot of things that didn't work and didn't work commercially and uh uh you know i've been able to parlay a, a really great musical life and music from the freshman and from photograph and from colorful yeah. uh but honestly back then it was like you know i i wish i would have just enjoyed it i don't remember being on you know i don't remember the actual moment of being present when i was on letterman when we were on the tonight show all of those things are such a blur right uh because not only was there you know copious um amounts of alcohol being <laughs> drank and uh <laughs> You know, and so, rock and roll, Brian. Yeah, rock and roll. A little bit you of, know, a little bit of dub, a little dabbling in you know drugs and that kind of thing. So, sure. You know, so it's hard to go back and think what was that like? The transition. The transition was gradual, um, but once we had hit MTV, once it was a buzz clip, at least for the freshmen, yeah. uh, we were off to the races, and honestly, did not pay attention to what was going on around us. You yeah. Know? Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. You're young. It's all happening so fast. And uh, yeah. I love that you reference Buzz Clip. I've talked about Buzz Clip here on the show before um, because we remember very well that that MTV figured out got to got to market all these hot new alternative bands coming out. So yeah. we got Buzz Clips. So you yeah. you would excitedly wait for like what's the next Buzz Clip? What's the next thing? And it was it's wild because there got to be so many that were thrown as, at us at the time. You know right. that you'd be like I don't know who's gonna stay and who's gonna go. I don't know who's gonna be here today and gone tomorrow. You know like I, right. I it's just it's just how it would go. <laughs> so. Well, also your you know the 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 gauge of what success is is different from a label standpoint uh, than sure. that of a band because just being in a band. A year before we got signed, I would have died just to have a video on MTV, to be there, to make a video with a great classic video director. We had Lawrence Carroll do our song Photograph. He was the set designer for uh, Smells Like Teen Spirit, you know. So we, we have all these, we had all these great opportunities. I would have died just to have that opportunity. But then once you're there, you go, oh, shit, we didn't make the buzz clip and everybody's bummed out. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yeah. just like, why can't we just enjoy that we're on MTV? You know? I know. And we did four or five videos that were on. So Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I remember. And uh, that is a true thing about 
perspective and getting older is that, uh, you know, I spent a lot of my youth also, you know, moving to Hollywood, trying to chase the entertainment career. And I thought once I have that one thing, I'll finally be happy. Once I finally get that opportunity, I'll finally be happy. And it's remarkable just how, you know, that really isn't how it works because all the people that I knew in my social sphere that we're getting the thing, we're getting the yep. dream, we're getting the movie roles. They, uh, they were still never satisfied. They were always right. going, but I need, I need more, I need more. And I remember a, a good friend of mine once saying to me when I was complaining and bitching about life in general, like you do, and he just said, hey, I want you to just kind of take a, a snapshot and a glimpse of you know what you've accomplished in the past 10 years. And these were things that aren't measured by the world because nobody right. knows about them, but they're measured by me. They're measured by what I wanted to do. And I remember sitting there and thinking about like, if I was to go back the 10 years prior and tell my younger self, the things that I would do over that next right. decade, I would have been, I would have been floored. I would have been blown away. I would have been thrilled yeah. by it. Yeah. And so yeah. that's where you truly realize that there really isn't this kind of measuring system of success that you can set against the world because it, it, it could all, there's always more, it'll never be fulfilled. So you just have to find a way to find this joy and contentment and satisfaction in the things that you're doing. And if they make you happy and they bring you joy and you like doing them, then that's, that's success. Right. That is success. That's right. I feel like the bottom, you know, being on the bottom uh, and yet not being in rehab or, yeah. you know, yeah, uh, you know, being able to have being on the bottom, but having a nice place to live and be able yeah. to afford food and, you know, these kinds of things. That is, for me, that bottom is the bar as far as my happiness goes. I have to look at that and say, these things around me, these these things that um, that I have, that I'm grateful just for having the basics are the bottom, they're the bar for me. As long as I have that now, creatively, I can raise the bar and raise the bar and raise the bar. And if things don't hit, I can always go back to just being a level uh, happiness. You know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's been I mean, meditation therapy helps these kinds of things. But that's been where I've been for the last you know 15 years. And it's been mm-hmm. wonderful. Life yeah. has been exponentially better because of that, you know, yeah. appreciating just the normal everyday things that we all take for granted. So know? true. It's so. so true. And children put things into perspective, too, because I know one of the things that I kept thinking about with my my sons is. I always wanted to, you know, I had all these ideas of what my life was supposed to be, but I remember growing up and watching my dad, you know, sludge away at a, at a, at a day job and really have an artist's heart. You know, he had an artist's heart and, and wanted to do something so much more creative and he never did. And I just remember thinking to myself, I was like, I think that I just want my children to see that. I love what I put my hands to. I loved, you know, I love the creating. I love uh, making people smile and bringing them joy. And as long as they can see that I kind of have a love of life and love what I do, it doesn't matter, you know, if I have a day job to pay the bills as long as I just keep on, you know, I keep, they see that I'm happy. I think it really yeah. is important, you know. Well, also, there's an energy about the house when you're happy and when you're not happy that kids pick up on easily, you yeah. know. Um, and so keeping a positive attitude in the worst times has been really important to me as well. Yes. So. And I haven't always been able to do it. I mean, there was no, definitely been- <laughs> none of us can do it all the time. We're right, constantly right. failing every day. You're going to fail at something. Right. You know? It's like the, you got to let the day go. By the end of the day, you just got to let it go and say, I'm not going to think about this tomorrow. That's true. <laughs> you know? That's true. When it when when did you become a dad? Um, was this uh, was this in the in the early 2000s? I was a dad early uh, by a, from a previous relationship. This was straight out of high school. Um, and so I've got grandkids, too, which is a whole, oh my goodness. Other, a Congrats. whole new world. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's funny because what my son got remarried and then he married a woman who uh, he had my son had two sons and then he remarried a woman had three kids. And oh, then wow. I went to I went to go meet them somewhere football game 
for uh, my grandson playing eighth, eighth grade football. And uh, all of a sudden these three kids came up to me, grandpa, grandpa, you know, and I had no idea who they were. <laughs> they were her other kids, you know. Oh my gosh, uh, how like, wild. It's too much, it's too uh. much. Does everybody <laughs> calm down, you know. Uh, but no, but then when I, you know, when I got married, uh, yeah, that was 2000, uh, 2004. So, mm-hmm. you know, my, our daughter was born, I've got a two, uh, two daughters, 2005, 2010, and then a son who was born 2015. So, you know, so I've got uh, 17, 12 and seven year olds. Oh my um, gosh. Yeah. I got a 14 and an eight year old. So I got yeah. those two right now. Mm. Um, well, you, so that, that obviously probably changed the life of a rock star. You know, you get, got married, you're, you've got kids, all that kind of stuff. So yeah. was that was that where things um, I don't know, the the priorities changed in the early 2000s, you know, after the success of mm-hmm. villains and the, the follow up mm-hmm. albums? Um, is that where you kind of started to look at things and get inspired by the whole, uh, you know, the family albums and, and that yep. trajectory? That's exactly what happened. Yeah, was being inspired by the kids and uh, thinking, I, you know, I you had to listen to so much garbage kids music. Oh, the worst, you know, over and over and over and listen over to this and stuff. You know, some people were making great, great kids music. They might be giants made a great kids record. You know, they did. That, yes, they did. They're naked ladies. Those guys too did some kids music. And there's other kids bands that have only done kids music that are fantastic. Mm-hmm. But you know, the kids gravitate towards you know the Wiggles and that kind of thing. And you hear that oh, over and over, and Teletubbies and the whole thing. So I. You know, I thought, well, let's make a rock record with four part harmonies and big guitars and make it sound like Queen, you know, put out a kid's record. And that was a blast to do. I, I mean, can that imagine. was so creative and so fun. Just, you know, the, the, the way, best way to explain it is, you know, if, if the Verp Pipe put out a rock album and we had an oboe solo on a rock album, it would be so ridiculously pretentious. <laughs> but on a kid's record, it's cool. Oh, my God, because that one kid who plays the oboe is going to go, oh, my God, there's an oboe solo. You know, finally, this kid, you know, uh, feels justified in his yeah. choice. Of Obo- oboe solo, oboe yeah. solo. Next yeah, time I so, come see you play live, I'm going to shout oboe solo in the middle. Please of don't. <laughs> Speaking of which, you have to let me know when you're if you're coming out to play L.A. because I got to come out and yeah. hang out. Uh, the, the reality is it's very difficult for an East Coast band to get out to the West Coast. It's so expensive. I've and heard LA, that. especially, California, especially with pay to play, uh, you know, there's, I lose money. I mean, we just played, we played a weekend. I wrote a blog about this. We played a weekend out in Denver and we thought, well, let's, if we're going to go out to Denver, let's go to some other places we hadn't been. So mm-hmm. we went to a couple surrounding cities, two or three hours away and that kind of thing. And I ended up losing, you know, personally lose four or five thousand dollars just getting to just getting denver out. and doing that those those group of shows so getting to california is a financial commitment that we cannot make and it's <laughs> like it's unfortunate but you know when you when you're yeah. an independent label uh and you're you know you're watching all the dimes and uh, that kind of thing there's no tour support you know yeah. uh you gotta you know i gotta look at the bottom line all the time I get it. I get it. You're, you're not the first person to tell me that. I, I remember, uh, um, someone telling me that was touring on the East coast. He said, it's got, it's a huge effort to get onto the other side. And it's something that a lot of people don't think about. You know, I, I, I know that musicians and bands and their comments often get like, come here, come to my city, come play here. Right. We'd love to see you here. And I don't think they understand that if nobody is, is helping, you know, finance that, that it really is a difficult thing to, you know, load up and get it all the way across the country and stay. Also and think about how many, how many opportunities on the East coast there are to play an hour away from each place or two sure. hours away. You know, you sure. go, you go to New York, you play in Connecticut, you're Long Island, you know, we play Long Island, you go to Albany, you go down to Washington, DC, Philadelphia, yeah. all these places. It's so easy to get to. In California or getting out there and then getting into California, it's just not the case. So yeah. spread out. So, so spread, spread out. out. That's yeah. The, yeah. We're just sprawling really over here. 
And though yeah. that means uh, you know, that means you know you play a show, you get in at two in the morning, and then you got to get up at six to get on the road because it's an eight hour drive to somewhere. You know that kind of thing. Yeah. It's just so far, it's just not worth it. We can't make it happen, I unfortunately. It. Well. Well, the good news is this episode's going to air, and oh my God, the demand is going to soar. Yeah, I'm counting on that. Why do you think I'm here right now? Yeah, right, <laughs> but, and then and then your confidence was a little shook when yeah. uh, when I didn't hit record on the Zoom video, like, and he was oh, like, man, "Oh, I'm never getting to the West Coast now. This is, uh, this is get awful. your shit together, uh, Gibbons." <laughs> well, I I also. Um, I also wanted to ask you, because it's a big part of the show, you know, the title Waterproof Records, your unsinkable tunes from the past, present and future. Um, mm. This whole show kind of began because I think for most people who play music and I, I don't mean to discredit anybody who didn't get into a music career or performance career, but um, music fanatics, there's usually that turning point where you hear you put on the record, you put on the tape, you put on the CD, you hit play on the stream for modern day. Yeah. Um, but you, you did it and your life is never the same. Mm -hmm. And I know that's dramatic, but it is a dramatic moment because you hear something, something gets through your soul and you are so compelled to whether it's pick up a guitar, play drums, play bass, sing, write. You're like, I have to do this because of what the effect it's having on me. So yeah. when we uh, messaged back and forth, I said, I got to know what your waterproof record uh, is and you said I said sweet baby James James Taylor yeah yes. that was the one for me and you talk about soul um, when I was a kid I was in kindergarten uh, first grade maybe and uh, my uh, Sunday school teacher I grew up in a very very strict Christian reformed home where we couldn't listen to you know secular Same. music much you know yeah Same. so we could listen to like john denver and you know james taylor and this kind of thing the stuff that was you know non-offensive in any way yeah. you know what i mean and uh and my sunday school teacher said that you should your imaginary friend should be jesus but make jesus one of your favorite people you know put a face on him not the face up on the cross you know make it you know that sad face up on the cross <laughs> right do it at a much you know? more enjoyable jesus moment like yeah. a dinner or something that's right and her her <laughs> jesus her imaginary jesus that she talked to every day was donny osmond right <laughs> I remember this and i said i'm gonna make my personal jesus james taylor because i knew a little bit about james taylor and uh and so and i thought oh he's kind of jesus like you know yeah, and he's, yeah you know, the long brown hair barefoot. back then and yeah the long hair and everything and you know uh and so i had my brother had the album sweet baby james and i'd listened to it over and over and over and up through many many years into adulthood i still have conversations with sweet baby james jesus every once in a while <laughs> and i'll even say it when something is awe inspiring to me i'll be sweet baby james jesus oh <laughs> you know? that is great you know so anyway so that was a really important uh album to me and when i started learning how to finger pick i would pick up the the needle on the record and go back and listen and go back three seconds or whatever just to learn how he was finger picking now he's got a website where he sh gives all his secrets away mm -hmm. but uh but back then it was such an important uh you know storytelling singing storytelling finger picking you know harry chapin james taylor cat stevens these are the guys what i learned how to finger pick and and uh and write story songs and um you know that to me uh, you know honestly when you look back at the 90s i think the freshman was one of the very few songs that were finger picked that told a linear story mm -hmm. and that goes to show you the influence that sweet baby james jesus had on me <laughs> yeah sweet baby <laughs> you know james I mean? jesus i may start sweet saying that now jesus. that's great <laughs> anyway I, so that's it that's the waterproof record for me for sure i'm so glad and and i'm glad you put it uh told the story as to how it came to be and i knew that you know given the time that you were born and when that album came out i was like that had to have been a um an album in the house as a child and that's often when the waterproof record happens right it's often right. an album sure. that you have access to easily sure. because back when we were growing up if it wasn't in your house you weren't yeah. hearing it. 
That's true. That's true. You know? Especially when you're a kid and you don't have any kind of, you know, disposable income that you can go buy a record, you know. Right. And there was no MTV, so you didn't really know what was going on in the world. You certainly didn't know what artists really looked like unless it was already in the house. I remember my brother snuck in a Kiss record. Oof. The first Kiss record uh, into our house, you know, probably sandwiched between Tony Orlando and Dawn and the Ray Khan of singers or some shit. Oh yeah. He had to hide uh, it because there would be yeah, a prayer circle if it was found. Yeah, of course. For sure. <laughs> and man, we listened to that record incessantly and loved it. Yeah. Loved that record too. You know, so I got a little bit of rock and roll chops from kiss as well. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah. You're you right can, though. And, it was older brother's influence on me, the music taste that I, you know, that I had for sure. Oh, that's the same story for me. I have an older brother. He's about two and a half years older than me. And he's my he's my uh, music soul brother. Like he's the guy that any band I'm checking out, I always call him first. You know, he still calls yeah. me and says, have you heard this? And we were like that when we were kids. He was older. He was cooler. He was listening to, you know, we were um, young and he, he found a college radio station. We're originally from Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's where I was mm -hmm. born and raised. Sure. And Great we city. also grew up in a, um, a Christian, very strict Christian home. And so my parents yeah. were not okay with yeah. a lot of the rock music. And so we, you had to hide it. You had to sneak it in. Uh, you know, right. I would get in trouble for MTV all the time. Yeah. Um, for trying to check out the shows that came on after 11, you know, midnight, the headbangers ball and 120 minutes and things like that. Um, so that was a big part of my youth as well. But when you said James Taylor, I was glad we got a chance to talk about it a little bit. And this was a, this was a cool moment for me because I haven't spent a lot of time with James Taylor and that has a lot to do with just generationally. Like sure. my parents weren't playing James Taylor in my home because they went a completely different path. So I didn't spend a lot of time with them. And by the time the nineties roll around while the Verve pipe is exploding. James Taylor was having this resurgence mm -hmm. um, and having kind of a, another moment in time. But by that time, it would have been meaningful for the people that grew up for him. But for teenagers, you're turning on the TV and you see this guy and you're like, who's this old fart? You know yeah, what I mean? Like you're just dismissive of him. Yeah, the most unlikely looking at that point, you know, he was totally bald no hair, and, you know, no hair. Yeah, and no uh, hair. Old, and you go older. and you go, this is easy listening. This is like, yeah, these are guys talking about their 401ks and their investments. And you're going, right. you know what I mean? Like, that's that is the connotation that I had as a teenager. And so for much of my adult life, I've been like, ah, James Taylor's not for me. It's not for me. And so you told right. me about Sweet Baby James and I listened to it. Oh, love that record so much. And I was really surprised. I mean, of course, Fire and Rain, I was like, I know this one. Yeah. yeah. Of course. And then Country Road, I'd heard that one as well. But I went through the album. I read a little bit about his story, and I was kind of blown away because I was like, you're telling me this dude used to have a heroin problem? Yeah, how about that? He how spent about time that? in a mental hospital and like the whole thing. He had it You're all. You're telling me this dude was yeah. signed by the Beatles Apple label? Yeah. That he was crazy? the first non, you know, he was the first American artist they sign? Well, think I, about this, you know, something in the way she moves. Yeah. The Beatles, George Harrison. My favorite also, Beatles song. Also, James Taylor has something in the way she moves. Yeah. So there was a bit of that crossover there where he, I believe he had mentioned it to George Harrison and George Harrison took that title and said, oh, that's a that's something there. Let's make Ooh. a song. So they both ended up making a song called Something in the Way She Moves. Wow. Each of them, each of them amazing songs. Right. So, each of them amazing songs. I know I, I read a quote where. Um, you know, the the producer, I'm drawing a blank on his name, the one who brought him to the Beatles to meet Paul and he played music for them. And there's this quote of Paul going like, I liked it. It was really good. You know, he's a good player, a good singer, yeah. you know, and yeah, I, I could yeah, just yeah. see that moment. Of <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, it's so great. But it is a really um, it's a very as I was listening to the album, I was like, man, you could stare out a window or be on a drive in the middle of nowhere and just kind of like just ponder and space. It was a very lonely feeling record. Mm -hmm. I, f I felt like my it instinct is a lonely was lonely record. It, it, it felt, it felt like I need, I need to, I need some time right now, you know, cause yeah. it's so small and he didn't even realize at the time, you know, uh, I'm sure, you know, all this knowing James Taylor, but I'm yeah. sitting here excitedly learning. I'm like, here's this guy I had this debut album. Didn't go the way that he thought. So yep. he's got the second album and they've given him, you know, they, they said, we'll, we'll give you $20,000 and 
you know, to, to finish this with this one extra song. And so that's why that sweet uh, 20 G sweet yeah. or whatever the last song. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why it's called that. And this really stripped down album was kind of just a what had to be done at the time, not really thought through. And he wouldn't realize that it was really the launch, the beginning of this singer songwriter movement that would come out of these over the top orchestrations and things that we had left from the Beatles and all these other right. bands doing really big productions. Right. And uh, that's to that's strip it down to the acoustic guitar, to strip everything down and keep everything and and have the um, uh, I guess, have the knowledge to to not put too much into the recordings because you're going to take away from the vibe, which is that lonely man vibe. You know, Nick Drake did it really well with Pink Moon, a man and a guitar, yes. and it's a phenomenal record, which Love is more album. stripped down than Sweet Baby James is. Uh, but, you know, to be able to do that and then to have a career after that, and especially put those albums out when nobody was doing it, uh, is a real testament to the song itself, how great right. the songs are. And for us, as the verb pipe, we go through the same thing. I have a tendency to want to put more and more on because I'm a huge XTC fan and there's so much going on in XTC records and Beatles records and even Ellis Costello. You know, there's so much going so on. So much happening. People that yeah. I love that I love that kind of production. Sometimes I have to sit myself down and say, stop, take, right. put the guitar down, you know, stop coming up with new parts, stop coming up with new harmonies and just serve the song. And that's the way we look at music now. So for sure, that's helpful. You, you sit and you think, what would Sweet Baby James do? <laughs> what would Sweet Baby James Jesus do? I was hoping you'd link that up. That's so it's cool. really too, it's really more satisfying if you add Christ on the end of it. Sweet Baby oh, James Jesus Christ. Sweet Baby James Jesus Christ. Can I get Jesus my food Christ. on time? Yeah. I was trying to sit here and think who would have been my face replaced uh, Jesus because I was thinking, you know, uh, my waterproof record, which is commonly known on here is Siamese Dream by Smashing Pumpkins. Great. But Great um, but the uh, the when I was younger, when my parents were strict and, you know, I wasn't allowed to have a lot of stuff in the house. So like one of the first artists that I really got into was like the Beach Boys. I got super into the Beach Boys. So I think I'd have like five Jesuses with the Beach Boys, yeah. you know. Um <laughs> yeah. but I I uh that's that's one of my earliest memories because I went and saw the movie Flight of the Navigator and yeah, they did sure. I get around and I was like, yeah. man, I need to have this in my ears all the time. That's one of the perfect placements of a song in a movie, by the way. I know exactly it really what you're is. About. It, it really, really is. is effective. Yeah. Yeah, which which funny. speaking of, I remembered, um, you know, the 90s were synonymous with incredible film soundtracks. Yeah. Um, you you always it's just not a thing anymore, but you can throw back and you can list off just dozens of movie soundtracks that are loaded with some amazing bands at the time. And it was a good way. It was like a compilation record for, you know, if you weren't into this artist or you you bought the soundtrack for this specific band and then you would find somebody else on there. Um, right. And I remember getting the Great Expectation soundtrack. And yeah. there, lo and behold, is Her Ornament by yeah. the Verve Pipe. So w what was that like doing a, a song for that soundtrack? Was it a good experience? Oh, amazing. Was it I mean, Alfonso Cuaron, great director, and uh, yeah. got to meet with him and talk about what the scene was. And um, he wanted something very excitable. Uh, exciting sounding and uh and we're like oh i'm up for that so being able to do that and then see it on the screen although it's quite short on the in the movie right you know it ended up that soundtrack ended up i think going platinum for it us did. you know it was one of those things that on occasion will pull out uh her ornament um great expectation for us the biggest the biggest soundtrack though was Definitely Rockstar and our song Colorful. That's right, Rockstar, and you played yeah. a character in the film. Uh, I played a, I played a character in the film, but even more importantly, the song Colorful, Mark Wahlberg lip syncs to my voice at the end of the movie, yeah. which is freaking weird. So weird. Uh, so weird. But, uh, you know, that song had, I think, at RCA gotten behind that as a single, that could have been a pretty big hit because I still to this day, I still have people all over the world 
you know, tag me with them covering the song. People love that movie. It's not a great movie. <laughs> I mean, frankly, I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's a pretty cliche it's, it's, movie. It's okay. <laughs> pretty cliche rock and roll story, yeah, though. I yeah. mean, it's funny because my brother at the time said, you know, you guys should have been an almost famous. I mean, that because that are, you know, it's one of the greatest rock and roll movies of all oh, time. It came out, came out within months of each other. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, now I look back and I go, you know, I see rock star played almost you know at least twice or three times a year somewhere i never see almost famous so financially speaking we made the right choice for yeah. sure because yeah. i'm still getting checks for colorful you yeah. know so that's um, great but you know you don't you know it's like i mean writing a song for the movie and seeing it uh, honored the way it was and mark was amazing he, he championed the song and uh, and it, it really was a special moment for us, even though the whole thing happened on 9-11. You know, the movie was released on 9-11. Our album at that time was released on 9-11. So it was kind of an omen, a bad omen for us, you know, to say, right, well, maybe this right. is the end of the road. And that's when we actually got dropped from RCA because they said, yeah, that they felt like that was um, there was nowhere to go um, after 9-11 for the band. So. But, well, geez, know. RCA, uh, why don't we just yeah. be a little bit more tender during one of the most horrible times in our American yeah. history? Jeez. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, they're running a business. I know. And, you know, they also had this thing going on at that time, which I at the time I was like, this is never going to take off. It was a little show called American Idol <laughs> that they had the soundtracks for. And I'm like, what is this bullshit? You know, what is this luck. bullshit? This isn't going to go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was a show, my business acumen is quite off at times. Well, little did we realize just how much the reality TV competition TV thing would be, you True. know, like when we were in the nineties and they were throwing the real world on MTV, we thought this was just a passing phase. Yeah, We didn't know sure. it would literally take over the airwaves and destroy MTV. Yeah. You know for what the I mean? most part, it really did. It I really mean, it's, did, it's, it's, it's a shadow of what it was once was, but I yeah. love that you worked on Rockstar and, and, uh, that song absolutely very recognizable and, and Mark Wahlberg going, Hey Brian, you know, yeah. <laughs> was, so cool. he was a good dude. He was a great dude. I mean, honestly, he was really, really funny. You know, I called him after I got a, I got a clip from the scene, the movie where he's lip syncing. And I called him, I said, Mark, man, you got to think about redoing this. Cause it doesn't look good. It looks like you're lip syncing, man. And Mark yeah. said to me, he said, don't worry about it, bro. No one's going to know the difference, right? Mm -hmm. And so to this day, people still come up to us after a show and they'll say, why would you guys play a Mark Wahlberg song? <sighs> <laughs> Heavy sigh. Heavy sigh. Heavy sigh. Oh. You know, all you do oh. is go, well, uh, you uh, know. What can what you, you do? do? What, what can, can you do? do? It's like well, when people ask for Bittersweet Symphony, it's the same thing. You just go, oh, I was, boy, you, you feel like you playing are. it tonight. You are the king of of literally getting to the question that I was going to ask next, because um, you set me up for the soundtracks perfectly, and here we are with the uh, with the band name question, which of course I'm sure you get asked this. You, you know, you've done so many interviews over your entire career, and of course anybody who remembers this time, you go, okay, you got the Verve, you got the Verve pipe, you got the Verve right. pipe, you got the Verve, right. and right. I know the difference. I know you know which one's which. Yeah. But I can imagine that's been a hilarious journey for you. Uh, with hilarious. People thinking you're going to do Bittersweet Symphony. <laughs> you know, we've thought about actually covering it just for the hell of it, because you can do any cover you want. I mean, we you cover should. so many songs. Why not just cover Bittersweet Symphony? And then afterwards at the meet and greet, I'm not going to have a bunch of people come up and go, oh, why didn't you guys play Bittersweet Symphony? Yeah, yeah. <sighs> uh, <laughs> and but then, literally what happened was we we – when those two bands broke up in the beginning and formed the verb pipe, we needed a name of the band because the artwork had to be done by a certain point for the album to be done. And so we came up with the name. Our guitarist just said the verb pipe. And we were like, what does that mean? Nobody cares. It's two in the morning. Right. We're drunk. Let's yeah. call it the verb pipe. And we sent the artwork out. And two months later, we saw in a music English music magazine, we were all fans of uh, Q and all those other magazines. Sure, uh, sure. Uh, we saw this band called The Verb. They had a new album out called The Storm. And we're like, wait a minute, the Ver what? There's a band called The Verb already? It's like, oh, shit. Well, what are the chances that they'll make it big and we'll make it big? You know, and it'll be a problem. Well, our hit singles were within months of each other. 
That's like, crazy. The, it I was remember crazy how that worked because we I were just remember. a small town band in Michigan, you know, and yeah. it's nuts how that happened. And to this day, I'll still take credit for Bittersweet Symphony. I mean, sure, the, sure, it's a good song. So it's a freshman. Say, now I we love just that need song. to get. Yeah. yeah, we need to get Richard Ashcroft to do uh, a yeah. freshman. That's what we there need. There you now. go. I'm sure that they got it worse. I know Richard had it worse because I know that back then when the uh, when the message boards and everything were up. They had so many people that said, oh, my God, I love the freshmen. And it must have just made their heads explode because their crowd was so different than our crowd. You know, we had a bunch totally. of teenage girls and yeah. they had all the, you know, the critic darlings. They were the critic darlings. So totally sure. very gloomy, very serious, yeah. too. I'm, you know? so, I'm positive it hurt, it's hurt them worse. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What I'm going to do is on my TikTok, I'm going to um, walk down the street like Rick, Richard Ashcroft in yep. Bittersweet Symphony, but I'm going to sing The Freshman. <laughs> there you go. You're going to have to beat me to it now. Good luck. <laughs> no, you take it. You take the it. You clock take it. You take is it. ticking. I actually did a parody of um, I did a parody of Bittersweet Symphony um, a while ago early on the channel. Um, where my wife and I, we went up the road and she is, it's hilarious because I did it and I put it out there. And the first thing that people said from England was I'm in and it's literally, wow, I just outed my city on the podcast. I'm going to need to beat that. <laughs> um, I, I was walking on the street and it's a bright, sunny LA day. And so it's, right. it's blue skies. And all these, you know, British people were like, oh, oh, yeah, who can forget the Ver video where he's walking in his sunny California day? Right, exactly. Um, exactly. But my bit, my take on it was, you know, I have I have kind of a, a goofy, smiley face, right? Like I always right. like to joke to people that I have the face of a youth pastor. And so <laughs> I, I totally have this like aw shucksiness. So I yeah. filmed Bittersweet Symphony where I was walking down the road and I bump into somebody, but I feel bad about it. And yeah, that was of kind of the bit where I bump into the shoulder and I'm like, I feel terrible. So, oh like, my God, well, this, so is, bad. this uh, is terrible. <laughs> and then I used the freshman. Um, I don't know if I'm, I'm the first one who started it, but I, I uh, the right when that teenage look thing was going, mm -hmm. I was sitting there. And I remember going on TikTok and it was it was a, a filter that wasn't available in the United States at first. You, I would find mm. it on other people's um, videos and it had the teenage look thing. And I would look and there was no button to say this. Effect. Oh, I see. I and see. so I sat there and I was like, well, damn, I kind of want to do this. And I was sitting there in my head going, you know, it'd be a good song. The freshman. That's that's the song. So yeah. I remember it was an early morning and I, I opened up my phone and there it was. It was like the number one thing that was that was available. Yeah. So I opened it up and I did the walk and I did the thing and I fit the freshman on there. And then I saw that it was spreading like wildfire, like wildfire. And I mean, of course, I have no idea if 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 somebody else did it at the same time for it was just in the zeitgeist and we were all feeling right. it. But then it made its way to you. And oh, I was great. like, yeah, yeah, it's such a such a great I mean, use of that song. It's so funny that, you know, I'm so thankful that that happened, first of all, um, just because, you know, it, it introduced a whole new generation to the song, young people in the song. And I had friends that actually cover they're in town here, play in a cover band and they'll play the freshman. And they say they always now they always get these little 16, 17, 18 year old girls come up, go, oh, my God, it's the TikTok song. It's the TikTok song. It's like, really? That's what we're reduced to now. Yes. But I mean, honestly, I'm thankful for it. You know, I'm thankful. Well, then for I'll it. take and credit. I'll yeah, take credit. Thank you. I'll give Brian, you. Brian, I'm going to take credit Jacob. right thank now. You. I'm going to say it for, to thank the you. whole world. I started oh, it, and okay. I am both the blessing and the curse that yeah. a new generation of people now refer to you as that TikTok song. <laughs> I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you so much. Again, I just try, just <laughs> trying to get the verve pipe out on the West Coast. That's what I'm trying to do. That's all um, we need. Man, I thank you so much for taking the time here with me today, and uh, I, I, I had an absolute blast. Uh, we're best friends now, right? That's that's that's. We're best friends. Best we're friends. We're best friends. Yeah. For life. Now I know. I know you live in Sunvale. Sunvale. <laughs> Good. You already forgot. <laughs> <laughs> it's all sun in California. Baby. It is all sun in California. It is all sun. Well, I am absolutely ecstatic to have had you on the show and uh, Thanks, learned a, a little bit about James Taylor today. So I think, there you uh, go. sweet I think baby I'll, James Jesus Christ. Yeah, sweet baby James Jesus Christ. It's uh, that <laughs> that title, that song. I mean, that album title is named after his nephew. In case yep. my listeners wanted to know that, um, mm -hmm. it's not his own name. He's not referring to his own. So he's naming his uh, his brother's child that they named uh, James Richmond. 
Taylor. And so he uh, named it after his nephew. So I thought that was really sweet. Highly recommend that album to everyone. It's yeah, I really do too. It's a mellow record. Love I it. really do too. And I, I think that uh, this is a cool uh, thing about this show is that a lot of the people that check out the show, they, they hear me talking about a lot of the 90s alt and they are well versed in their verve pipe for sure. You know what I mean? Nice. Like the people who listen to the show know the verve pipe. But if you don't know James Taylor... Uh, very well and you only think of him as that guy who didn't have his hair on TV in the 90s and you wrote him off like I did I I sat down and I was really pleasantly surprised um, by Sweet Baby James I thought it was a very cool very very cool well I'm glad Uh, I turned you on to that yeah I am too I am too and for those of you who haven't listened to all the incredible music that Brian Vander Ark has written he has just a lot of albums a lot of music he's quite a prolific (laughs) yeah a lot of albums and very prolific songwriter good songwriter great hooks great guitar parts and uh just a lot of music out there and um and if you got kids he's got two family focused albums that you can listen to but he's not going to play your kids birthday party so let go of that notion he's done nope he's done will not do it didn't you put cereal (laughs) in your guitar once once every night every day every night that was part of the show show, that was part of a show we had a song called cereal and i would fill up my guitar with two family-sized boxes of fruity pebbles and then oh my god out at the end of the song all over my face and it was the worst part about that and the best part the most entertaining part was that all the kids would come up to the stage and eat this disgusting cereal off the stage (laughs) at the end of it oh so fun kids are the worst (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> kids are germ factories that's for sure for sure that's oh sweet. that's so good well again thank you so much for coming on waterproof records it was an honor to have you here and uh one of these days then i'll get my ass over to the east coast and come see you out there then that sounds we'll good do. yeah hey thanks jake good. appreciate you man. yeah thanks brian appreciate it take care man. yeah take care um you guys, that was so cool. Um, it's kind of funny because at the very beginning of the interview, uh, if you weren't aware, I don't know if I'm going to air it or not, but we're sitting there. Um, I get my camera going over here to roll, and then I'm down here. He's on the Zoom call. But if you haven't used Zoom before, you have to hit the Zoom record button in order for me to have any video footage that's usable at all for this episode. So we start talking and then I look down and I'm like, Jacob, you idiot. You didn't hit record on the Zoom call. So you have no video footage. So at that point in time, I was like, look, the only way this is this awesome opportunity to have Brian Vander Ark on your show is going to work is if you take the time and just start from scratch. So um, I haven't made the decision yet whether or not you have heard it at the top of the show or I cut it. But he was very gracious. We had a had a laugh um, after we'd already talked for just a few minutes up top to kind of start again with me. But um, what a great dude. What a really nice guy. And it was awesome to have him come on the show. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Waterproof Records. Remember, I can't continue on unless everybody in the world knows about the show. I can't make this a success until you help me make it a success. So my goal, and it's a very humble goal, is to become the biggest music podcast in the world. Is that, is that too much to ask? Is that too much to ask? Can we do that? Can we beat them all? Can we be number one? In the uh, like iTunes music charts, could you get me there? It's not that important, actually. I'm happy just to have the select few of you here. But thank you again for checking out this week's Waterproof Records. Let me try that again. Thank you so much for checking out this week's Waterproof Records. And we will see you next time. Make sure to check out DistroKid, distrokid.com, slash VIP, slash Waterproof. See you next time on Waterproof Records. Bye. Thank you.